It is time for chapter two, everyone. So this chapter uh, is about energy, particularly when it comes to sports, as this course is sports nutrition. It's really important to talk about energy because that is exactly what our muscle cells need. For any activity we're going to do, our muscle cells need fuel in order to do them. We could have this chapter when discussing any type of nutrition course, but the reason why it gets its own chapter in sports nutrition is because it's so important. If we want our muscle cells to contract like Ferraris, we have to fuel it well. You don't put that cheap gas in your Ferrari. Uh, I mean, maybe you have a Ferrari, but <laughs> people don't put cheap gas in a Ferrari it's not going to go as well. So we need to think of our muscle cells as finely tuned little machines. And it's really important to fuel them properly. And in doing so, you can really, I mean, really maximize your performance. Here's our outline. Don't be intimidated. I am here to help everyone. This is what I already said. We need to fuel our muscles like the finely tuned machines that they are. I really should put a Ferrari here rather than a Mini, right? <clears throat> okay, more important for athletes. There we go. This might seem obvious, but I think it's really important to break it down. How is it that our muscles are going, I think I should use white. Let me change, it might be kind of hard to see on this background. Let me change this to, let's go here. Let's change into a white background. Or maybe even, how about yellow? That'd be good. Yes. So if we're gonna have our muscles contract, they need fuel. How do we get fuel to them? Well, we eat. Hopefully, you're eating mostly <clears throat> good foods. Once that gets into our body, we have to digest and absorb those nutrients. And then we have to convert them, particularly glucose, which is a carbohydrate, as we already know. We have to convert them into ATP because ATP is our usable energy source. This is really important. Usable, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, we know our cells can utilize glucose. It's a fuel source, but there's this chemical step. In other words, glucose is, it just isn't in a usable form. So we must convert that glucose into a usable form called ATP. And ATP is what is like that gasoline. Really important. I'm not gonna ask you what ATP stands for. It does stand for adenosine triphosphate. But the important thing is that we have to convert glucose into ATP. And ATP is that usable energy source. Um, this is, a, again, maybe a little bit morbid, but ultimately, if we didn't give ourselves any energy, they would die. Just like a car without any fuel will not go. Okay, it's going to be intimidating, maybe, but hopefully you've already learned. You got me. I'm here to help you, okay? All right. Um, we're going to get a little bit into almost like physics, I guess, kind of. But let's just keep it simple. When we talk about energy, energy is simply the ability to do work. And we're really talking about our muscles here. Our muscles can be a simple example of mechanical work. We can contract our biceps brachii to lift a weight. That's a mechanical form of work. We can have electrical energy. Think about the nerve impulses going into the muscle to tell them to contract. We have to have that electrical energy, that electrical current, the nerve impulse. So it's not just about the mechanical contraction of a muscle. 
There's electrical energy. We have to have that nerve impulse going into it. No nerve, no, no nerve impulse, muscle's not going to contract. We have chemical energy. Chemical energy is that ATP. So if we look more specifically, we turn that glucose into ATP. And it is the release of ATP that allows the muscle to contract mechanically. Sometimes, even when we're exercising, we have to thermoregulate, and we may even rely on a form of radiant heat. So you see, it's not just the mechanical work that is energy. There's all sorts of other forms of energy that we rely on. There's also energy expenditure. And this is a value that we assign to how much energy it takes to do something. How much energy it takes. The easiest way to think about it, even though it's, al it's not always gonna work, how much energy it takes. Usually we're saying how much energy it takes to do something. For example, what is the energy expenditure of running one mile? In other words, how many calories of energy do we burn? How many calories? Because we can use kilocalories. That's what we use in this country. The um, international unit would be kilojoules. But how many calories of energy does it take to run a mile? Oh, about 100. How many calories did I burn doing the Ironman triathlon back in July? Oh my God, probably 6,000. So we can quantify energy expenditure. How much energy we can quantify? How many calories? I've already given you this as an example, but we utilize all different types of energy. Be, ex be able to give an example of each. Mechanical energy is just contracting our biceps. Electrical energy, the best example of that is a nerve impulse. Chemical energy, um, excuse me, chemical energy, I said one example is producing ATP. Another example is storing glucose as glycogen. Radiant energy could be our eye's ability to bring in light rays. That usually helps with activity. And also we can use some of this with our ability to thermoregulate. So all forms of how we can do work. Boom, boom. All right, now let's talk about those units. So we just finished saying, well, energy is the ability to do work. We have different types of energy. We can do work mechanically, chemically, electrically, radiantly. So we have the ability to do work, energy, and we also have an ability to quantify work, energy expenditure. How much work does it take to run a mile? Well, when we talk about quantifying that energy, commonly we use calorie. Now, technically, one kilocalorie is equal to 1,000 calories. However, in the nutrition world, now if we were working in a thermodynamics lab, we would definitely want to differentiate between those two. But in the nutrition world, we kind of use the terms interchangeably. So whether it's a calorie or a kilocalorie, for our purposes, we're just going to have them mean the same thing. So make sure that you know the specific definition of a calorie, the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Now again, your exams and quizzes, they're not short answers, they're not essay. So you just have to be able to pick from a list. The amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Secondly, I think it's, it's helpful to learn what this means in more understandable terms. So in more understandable terms, calories are units of heat. Heat 
when we bring in that food, digest, absorb it, convert it into ATP, that process generates heat. You know, if you were to measure core temperature and metabolic rate, right after you eat, your metabolic rate, your core temperature goes up because your body is working. Your body is working to break down that food, to absorb it and metabolize it, and it generates heat. Our body can use that heat as energy. Our body is able to use that heat as energy. So I'm really trying to simplify it. If we say that a Big Mac has 580 calories, what that means is after you eat it, your body will break it down, absorb it, metabolize it. In the process of doing all that, it generates a bunch of heat. And we can use that heat as energy. How much energy? Well, about 580 calories worth. Um, a rice cake may have 15 calories. So when your body digests and absorbs and metabolizes that, it will release about 15 calories worth of heat that can be used as energy. So make sure you know the specific definition of a calorie, the quantity of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius, and then make sure you know it's more simple definition, units of heat. And our body can use that heat for energy. Okay, sometimes I just repeat a slide because I really want you to get it. Um, we can also use joule or a kilojoule or a megajoule. Um, here in the U.S., we're more likely to use calorie, so that's what we're going to use. I'm just pointing out, you don't have to know it, but I'm just pointing out that a pretty equal equivalent is a kilojoule. Roughly 1,000 calories equals 1,000 kilojoules. It's not quite exact plus or minus 100 or whatever in the 1,000 example, but they're pretty close. But you don't need to know that. All right. Now, when we talk about this process that we, if I could draw, I would be dangerous. Um, let's see. Let's draw eyes, nose, mouth. Here's my person got hair, eyeball. Look at that. <laughs> so if we have food and we eat that food, that food's got to be digested and absorbed and it will release heat. And we can use that heat as energy. Look at that. Perfect. Now what I want to point out is it is not 100% efficient. So if we bring in a food that technically has a thousand calories. Now the calories that you read on a nutrition label, they've actually already taken this into consideration. But I'm saying if we were in a, like I said, thermodynamics lab and we actually had a contained 1,000 calories, once it went through the body, we would only maybe be able to use about 20 to 40 percent of that energy. Here we go. So in the human body, about somewhere between 20 to 40 percent is all that we're able to capture. And this is a measure of efficiency. Let's say that in a thermodynamics lab, we had something that started off as a thousand calories. After it goes through the body and it releases heat in terms of calories, we may only be able to capture 
What's 20% of 1,000? 200 to 400 of those calories. Now, you may think, that's really crappy. That's not very good. Well, I'll tell you what. It's much better than most man-made machines. Um, okay. Um, I thought I had another example here. I apologize for moving around. Yeah, the body is still much more efficient than man-made machines. Man-made machines might be, at best, 10 to 15%. Think of a power plant or, um, you know, like a wind farm to generate energy. Think of your car. You know, what is the reason why internal combustion engines, not, not, your, not a Tesla, but an internal combustion engine, why is it that we have a radiator? Well, to get rid of the heat. So we release so much heat from the car. We're only able to, the engine is only able to capture 10 to 15%, maybe 10% of the energy that's produced. The rest escapes as heat. So it's a law of nature. And what I'm saying is that the body is better than most machines, man-made machines. So body is more efficient. Let me be more specific. Body is more efficient than a man-made machine. That's really impressive. So I know... The initial range here, 20 to 40%, is pretty low at first glance. But when we compare it to a 10% efficiency rate in a car, our body is two to four times better. We're pretty happy with that. And again, remember, <clears throat> this example, the nutrition labels don't give you this value. They give you this value. So the, the nutrition labels, you know, a Big Mac, 580 calories or so. That nutrition label gives you how much energy our body is able to capture. But know that initially it had so much more energy, but we were only able to capture 20 to 40% of it. You don't need to be able to do an equation, um, just the definition, and that it's 20 to 40% efficient. Um, training can improve, can improve this. So if we have the same output of energy, whether it's a hundred kilojoules or a hundred calories, maybe someone who's trained like Lance Armstrong is able to capture 45% of that. Whereas a regular Joe can capture 20%. So within that 20 to 40% range, training matters. The better trained you are, the better and more efficient your body gets. Okay? And in some rare instances, I mean, Lance Armstrong's a pretty extreme example. He is uh, genetically gifted. He may be able to go a little bit above that. But for most everyone, we are between 20 and 40% efficient at capturing the calories and heat from food. Okay, so how do we measure this energy, says the science dude. So we can measure both the calories in food and we can measure how many calories, units of heat, we expend during exercise. So one way you can look at this as this would be calories in, calories I ingest through food, and this would be calories out, calories that I am using as heat to produce energy. We can measure both, and it may not surprise you to know that it's hard. There are so many factors, such a complex system, um, it can be hard to do. Definitely harder to measure calories out. Um, a little bit easier to measure calories in. So this is calories in. Energy that food contains. <clears throat> and this is calories out. How many calories we burn during exercise. Okay. 
So now we're first talking about measuring calories in. We want to know, in that Big Mac, how many calories does it contain? And remember, calories, the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Or calories, a unit of heat that when brought into our body, we can use as energy. All right. We can use something called calorimetry. I suppose this method that I'm going to show you is probably specifically indirect, so it's a bit of a typo here. So this is called indirect calorimetry. This picture right here is something called a bomb, I know, cool, right? Calorimeter. We have one of these on our campus here at Hudson Valley Community College, AKA Harvard on the Hudson. If you sign up for the Bio 127 sports nutrition class with a lab, you will get to use this piece of machinery. Very, very cool. Let's talk about this bomb calorimeter. <clears throat> You're obviously not going to be asked to know all the specifics, but I like you in general to understand how it works. When I have this lab in person, <laughs> when we do this lab, I basically say we're going to we're going to burn some shit up. We're going to burn food. And that's exactly what we do. But pay attention to how it's set up. We have our chamber. So you can see there's a sealed chamber. Okay. And we have one of these. So it's like a little, um, I'm not, what's the size? It's kind of like a, a big Folgers coffee can size. It's a big one. And it's sealed, airtight. And inside that, we put our food sample. So this yellow, delicious looking mash is our food sample. Look at that. Looks delicious. Kind of looks like what they would slop on in elementary school in the food line, the cafeteria. Ha ha. So we have our food sample in a sealed chamber. Notice around the chamber is water. This is why it's called indirect. So what we do is, is we have a, the computer, because it's attached to a computer, of course it is, takes a baseline temperature reading of the water. We have a baseline temperature of this water. See, look at the thermometer. Then we ignite food. How about that? Yay! We burn that shit up. <laughs> Excuse my language. And what's going to happen as that food, hey, as that food burns, it's going to give off heat. See the ignition coil? We burn it. It gives off heat. So the temperature of the water surrounding it increases. When the food has been completely burned, to smithereens, nothing left, retake temperature of water. And then through an equation, an algorithm, it's able to spit out a number of how many calories is in that food item. It's called indirect because we're not directly measuring the temperature coming off of the food sample. It's very difficult to do that. So water is a really good medium for that. So we measure the temperature change of the water around it. Pretty cool, isn't it? We have one of these. There it is. We have that same one. Have the basic idea of how this works. There's the sealed chamber. Even though you can't see it, there's water all surrounding this. Press a couple of buttons, bing, bang, boom. It burns, uh, and then it, the screen gives you a reading. So, if it's a high calorie food, like a Big Mac, it's gonna give off more heat, and it's going to heat the water surrounding the chamber more. If I put in there a rice cake, low calorie food, so it probably won't burn as long, and it won't give off as much energy. Therefore, it, excuse me, it contains less calories. Now, before I go on, let me ask you, 
What if I'm talking about that Big Mac? You know, we have the patty. You have the uh, piece of tomato. You have the onion. What do you want on your burger? Some ketchup, maybe? Some ketchup squirted on there. And then we have our bun. This is really fun to draw this. Uh, what can I draw the bun as? Kind of like this color, maybe? We have our bun. Sesame seed. The special sauce on the Big Mac. How could I have forgotten about that? It's kind of like a uh, Thousand Island. Special sauce, baby. <laughs> okay, I was way over overdue for that. So how do we measure a Big Mac? I mean, are we going to end of it? Because the... This little food chamber, this little food chamber, it can't hold a whole lot. You're not going to be able to fit a, a Big Mac in there. So how are we going to do it? Am I going to individually measure the bun, the ketchup, the lettuce, the tomato, the meat, the special sauce? You could. That seems like a lot of work. So usually what happens is they homogenize the food. They put it in a blender. So in other words, they homogenize it. So it's kind of in a liquid form. So you, you put a smaller sample of food in the calorimeter that is representative of the overall burger. That's pretty cool. All right, now we're gonna get into some numbers. <clears throat> when we look at different nutrients, we have lipids, which are fats, carbs, and protein. Well, it turns out not every nutrient burns the same. Let's look at, in general, protein and carbs. They give off about the same amount of heat. <clears throat> now look down here, this is extra, but oh my God, am I so excited. Protein, for example, contains about this much, but we can only use about this much. And of course, we lose more of that in the process. But just another reminder that we're not able to capture all of the energy. Um, and if I look at this, let's look at, <clears throat> excuse me, let's look at protein. What did I say it gives off? For every one gram of protein, it will give off about four kilocalories of energy. For every one gram of protein, it will give approximately how many kilocalories? One gram of protein, 4.05, 3.87, 4.37, 3 3.11. You don't need to know these numbers, but what I'm pointing out is that each type of protein gives off a little something different. But if we were to average all these, the average is about Four. So on average, every one gram of protein can yield four kilocalories of energy. Carbohydrates is about the same. Again, different types of carbs may give us slightly different ones, but on average, about four kilocalories of energy. Now, look at lipids. These are more bang for our buck. Lipids can give us over twice as much energy. That's amazing. On average, one gram of lipid, lipid can be um, broken down into about nine kilocalories of energy. Know these numbers. Here we're beginning to see why, does our, why do our muscles like to burn fat? Because they give us so much more energy. Our muscles prefer to burn fat. It's great. You get twice as much energy for the same one gram. However, fats are more difficult to break down. There's more steps in the digestion, absorption, and metabolism process. Therefore, our muscle cells cannot rely on lipids alone. So we utilize a lot of carbohydrates. And we talked about this last chapter. Carbohydrates is our, are our muscles' first energy source. Why? Because we can metabolize carbs very quickly for energy. 
even though our muscles would like to burn off fat, they can't. It takes too long. So we get the best of both worlds. We get quick energy carbs. It may not be the most fruitful, but it's a really good energy source. And we can get it quickly. But then when our muscles are able, when there's enough time, they like to burn fat also because it gives us twice the energy. Isn't that great? Fantastic. Know these numbers. Okay. This is just some review based on what we just said. So which nutrient will contain the most calories once metabolized in our body? Fat. Which nutrient gives the body the most energy? Fat. Which nutrient should be ingested during activity? If you're exercising for an hour or longer in duration, you should be ingesting carbs. And we're going to talk plenty about this later. If you are exercising continuously for an hour or more, you should be ingesting carbs, if anything, because they can be metabolized quickly. You don't want to weigh yourself down with fat that takes so much energy to digest and it takes longer. So you might be finished with your activity before we even have the fats available. Now, sometimes if it's a really, really, really long exercise session, like the Ironman, you might want to include some fat, but always, always, always carbs are going to be number one during exercise. Okay. So that was, how do we measure calories in? How do we measure how many calories are in a food? We talked about indirect calorimetry calorimetry using a bomb calorimeter. Now, now we're going to measure calories out. Wouldn't it be pretty amazing to see how many calories Lance Armstrong burned? Absolutely amazing. Now, it is possible to utilize a direct calorimetry route, Um, but it's very difficult, nearly impossible. So you could, and in the world there are a couple, you could have someone exercising in a specialized chamber of which you would have water coursing through it. And as the person exercises, they're giving off heat. And then we measure the temperature of the water. But it's very difficult because you have to control for everything. I have to make sure that I can keep the person at a safe, cool temperature. I have to make sure that I'm bringing in the oxygen supply so I can control for every variable. So it is possible, but it's very difficult to do. There's other ways to try and assess or estimate how many calories you burn doing an activity. And these are more realistic ways. So we're going to utilize another form of indirect calorimetry. But remember, now we're measuring calories out. So before, with the bomb calorimeter, we were measuring how many calories were in a food. And that's calories in because we eat the food, bring the food into our body. Now we're measuring calories out. How many calories we burn doing an activity. We're able to do this indirectly. And we use gas exchange. You could probably stop there and have enough information. If you want to get more detailed, you can listen to what I'm gonna say shortly. But, and I'm gonna explain how, but basically we're gonna be able to estimate how many calories somebody somebody burns by measuring gas exchange. We're gonna measure how much oxygen a person breathes in. Likewise, we're going to measure how much carbon dioxide a person breathes out. It's pretty crazy, right? I mean, it's much easier for us instead of trying to measure the heat coming off of our body. And then there's the whole thing where some of that heat is going to be turned into sweat and evaporated as we exercise. Some of it's going to be the sweat goes into our clothes and it's saturated into our clothes and we don't count it in the measurement. It's really hard. So... We have this workaround where through our understanding of chemistry, 
we can measure gas exchange. Now, if you want to know a little bit about the chemistry behind it, a low-level activity doesn't need as much ATP, and therefore we don't need to bring in as much oxygen. And if we don't bring in as much oxygen, we don't breathe out as much CO2. Everything is related. When we talk about our muscles exercising, not only do they need fuel, ATP, our muscles also need oxygen. The chemical reactions that are needed to contract a muscle require fuel, ATP, and oxygen. So because our muscles utilize both, there's a direct relationship. When we take in more fuel to contract a muscle more forcefully, we're also taking in more oxygen. And then the opposite of true. If it's a higher level activity, we need more ATP and we bring in more oxygen and we breathe out more carbon dioxide. So because our muscle needs both and because they're directly related, we can use this workaround. Here's what it looks like. It's not the best picture and I apologize. We have one of these in our laboratory on campus. If you take the Bio 127 Sports Nutrition with a lab, we put someone on a treadmill. This, this dude's on a bike, it could also be done on a treadmill. We have them wearing a breathing apparatus and then we make them exercise. And how this works is one side of the breathing apparatus is measuring oxygen in And the other side of the breathing apparatus is measuring carbon dioxide out. And the computer, let me use a different color. The computer that it's attached to analyzes it. So based off of how much oxygen we breathe in and how much CO2 we breathe out, when someone's doing exercise in the lab, either on a stationary bike or on a treadmill, we put it into an equation with the person's age, height, weight, gender, and it spits out how many calories, as an estimate, the person burned. This is probably the most common in a lab setting, and it's the most accurate that we have. So uh, a well-calibrated unit can be pretty accurate. So I'm going to put pretty accurate. When I did my studies for my PhD dissertation, we used this method. And I was able to say this person consumed this much oxygen during activity, this, mer this person exhaled this much carbon dioxide. I was able to also say this person burned approximately X number of calories. Now there's other methods, and these are kind of old. You know, this is the old school Nike fuel belt. I'm aging myself on this slide. Now we have the um, Apple Watch. The Apple Watch has some type of accelerometer in, in it. Maybe you've heard of the Whoop device. Whoop is a strap you wear around your wrist that also contains accelerometers. Um, so they're little basically computer chips that measure a person's, um, how can I think of this? An accelerometer measures a person's position in space. So it measures if you are moving your arm up and down, if you're lying down, if you're running. And based off of that accelerometer, many of these also have gyroscopes, like the WHOOP does. Um, based off of your change in position in space, it can estimate how many calories are burned. This is less accurate less accurate than using the gas exchange. Now, these are becoming much more popular. You can even buy a little breath analyzer. Um, I don't know how credible and accurate those are at the moment. Um, so far, the WHOOP is the most accurate substitute for the good old fashioned lab setting with the device that measures your breathing. But who knows? Um, the technology is changing so much that it may get better and better and better. Um, you know, back in the day, I used to say, look at this cheaper one you could buy. Um, this is obviously outdated. An Apple Watch. Uh, Apple Watch is okay. They're getting better. 
But if you're really interested in doing something like this, I would recommend the Whoop. I just purchased one myself. Okay. Um, accelerometers are also used in concussion research because it can measure not only a position in space, but it can measure forces placed upon it. You don't need to know this, but there it is. Okay. Now, that indirect calorimetry method of using gas. So again, we're talking about measurement of calories out. We talked about estimating this through gas exchange. Really, the most accurate way we can reasonably try and estimate how many calories we burn during an activity is through gas exchange, where we purposely measure how much oxygen comes in, and we purposely measure how much carbon dioxide comes out. And because oxygen demand in the muscles has a direct relationship with ATP use in the muscle, and therefore contraction, duration, and intensity, we can get a pretty good estimate of how many calories someone burns. But you know what else this information gives us? Because in measuring gas exchange, we measure amount, quantity of oxygen we breathe in, and we measure quantity of CO2 we breathe out. Not only can we use this to estimate number of calories burned, we can also use this gas data to give us something called the respiratory exchange ratio, RER. I'm going to be going over this and referencing back to this over and over and over and over. So respiratory exchange ratio, it is what it says it is. It's a ratio of respiration. So we do the volume, V means volume, the volume of CO2 produced divided by the volume of oxygen consumed. So once we get that gas data, and usually we get it either on a 30 second or a minute interval, so while someone's running that mile and we want to measure how many calories they burn, the computer is going to tell us every minute in that minute, what's the volume of oxygen they brought in? What's the volume of CO2 they brought out? What if they breathed out, let's say at rest, probably at rest, um, a VCO2 is probably, I don't know, 500 mils, 500 mils of CO2 breathed out per minute. And let's say that that person breathed in 600 mils. They breathed in 600 mils in that same minute. Well, we do the math, and I have my calculator beside me because I'm not that good at math. That is a 0.83 RER. So by getting that number, that quotient, we can look over here because look, when the RER is 1.0, that tells us that our muscles are burning 100% carbs. When we get to about 0.85, our muscles are burning somewhere around a 50-50 carbs to fat ratio. Now let's look at, I think I have a, do I have a... Sorry about that, I thought I had a chart, but I don't. That's okay. When we get down to 0.7, we're burning all fat. So this 0.83 ratio is telling me that I'm burning, I don't know, maybe it's 48. No, no, wait a minute, I got that backwards. Maybe it's 52. And there's a chart where you can get this. Maybe it's 52% carbs. 48% fat. This is pretty cool, ladies and gentlemen. Just from that gas data, based on our physiology and chemistry, when you do the division, VCO2 divided by VO2 per minute, that number tells us what our muscles are burning for energy.
Know these numbers, my friends. Cool. Okay. Now, we're going to step back a little bit, and I know it could be a little confusing, but we first talked about calories in. We talked about how many calories does the Big Mac contain? It's calories in because it's food that we eat into our body. Then we talked about calories out. The calories out that we talked about was this. How many calories we burn doing an activity? You burn about 100 calories running a mile. Okay? But that makes up only a portion of all of the calories our body burns. So this says total energy energy expenditure. This is all calories burned, or maybe total is better. All calories burned. So let me give you an example. Let's say that Let's say that per day. Let's give an example. I'm not going to make you know these specific examples, but I think it can be helpful to understanding. Let's say that in total, maybe my body on average burns about 2,600 calories. So if my total energy expenditure is 2,600 calories, Only a portion of that was calories I burned during exercise. Let's do the math. I tend to exercise for an hour to two hours a day. Take one day off a week, maybe two, depending on the time of the year. So let's say for a two-hour workout, I burn, let's say it's an hour and a half workout. The numbers will work out better with this. So let's say that for exercise, I burn 800 calories. Probably on an hour, 20 minute ride, that's how many calories I would burn. But our body burns so many other calories. I wanna introduce you to something called basal metabolism, basal metabolic rate. Anytime you see the word basal, it's the, in in this context, energy expended, and energy expended by your body to carry out normal, just to keep your heart, to keep your organs working. So just to keep my organs working at rest, at rest. In other words, if I sat on the couch all day, I mean, not that I would ever do that, but if I sat on the couch all day, didn't exercise, didn't really walk around much, my body is still burning a lot of calories. Why is that? You got to keep your heart pumping. Even if you aren't exercising, your body parts still need blood, oxygen. Your kidneys are still filtering blood. Your digestive tract is still working. You're still sending nerve impulses. Basal metabolic rate makes up most of our energy expenditure. You should know this, somewhere between, somewhere about two thirds, two thirds of all of our energy that our body expends is just to keep our organs going. This might surprise you, but it is absolutely true. We can really burn a good amount through exercise, but when we're fueling, we're not only fueling for that one to two hour exercise session. We're fueling for the entire day. Even when you're sleeping, your organs are still working because you're still alive. (laughs) A quick way to estimate, again, this is really a quick way to estimate, would be to take your body weight times 10. So I weigh about, I don't know, 150 pounds, and I would just take that times 10. Of course, everyone is different, age, gender, activity level. So many things factor into this. I'm just giving you a ballpark, ballpark. 
your body weight times 10. So if I use that for myself, that is 1,500. So if I go down to my example, so through exercise, I burn 800 calories. Through basal activities, I burn 1,500. Let me do the math here. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1,500 plus 800. That's 2,300, which leaves only... 300 left for thermic effect of food, which is, a, which is basically the energy it takes to digest. That leaves only 300 calories. This is just an example. But have an idea of these percentages. Most, 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 60 to 75%, two-thirds of all of our calories that we burn each day Go to fueling our everyday organs, even at rest. Exercise is usually somewhere between 20 and 35%. That doesn't only mean when I'm actually exercising, running, biking, playing a sport. It could be going up and down stairs as you walk throughout your day. That's exercise. And then thermic effect of food is just energy used to digest. And that is usually about 10%. This is about 10%. This is about 20 to 35%. Now, of these three, which is the only that is which is the only one that is variable that we can actually have a lot of control over? Exercise. So this is the one that we can have the most control over. Your basal metabolism is largely genetic. It is affected by age, gender. Um, someone who's more active will have a higher metabolism, but you can only change it a little bit. The amount of energy that we expend for digestion stays at about the same. And then um, this is a little bit higher, right? Because 300 calories is about 20%. So these aren't exact numbers, but you get my idea. I mean, good stuff, isn't it? Okay, so again, basal metabolism, calories we burn at complete rest. It is about 60 to 75% of all of our calories. You can break it down in calories burned per minute, but you don't need to know those numbers. This makes up most of our energy expenditure, biggest part of the pie. There are things that can influence basal metabolism, so it can be influenced. If you have more lean body mass, it will increase your basal metabolism. As you get older, as we increase age, metabolism, metab metabolic rate goes down. Gender. Women tend to have a lower basal metabolic rate than men. Some of these you can't change. I cannot change my gender very easily physiologically. I cannot change my age. Uh, I can change my lean body mass. So you can do some things, but it's only going to be a smaller change. Ethnicity sometimes can affect your basal metabolic rate and stress. You don't need to know any of these. I would like you to know these three. What's the relationship between those three things and basal metabolic? I've already told you this, um, a simple, quick way to estimate your basal or resting metabolism. And this is kind of the same thing as basal metabolism. Same thing, really, for our purposes. Take your weight, multiply by 10. Gives us a ballpark. Thermic effect of food is just cal calories we burn digesting food. You can see a breakdown, but you do not need to know these. Proteins are the hardest to break down, which we're going to discuss when we get to proteins. You should know that we require about 10% of all of our calories to be utilized to break down food. Exercise is the most variable. More you exercise, more energy you burn. Okay, we're coming down towards the end here. There's other ways that we can quantify things. So when we talk about only exercise, if we look only at exercise, well, 
not every exercise is the same. Don't I burn a different number of calories playing a racquetball game than swimming in a pool, than playing chess, than doing an Ironman? So within this exercise, in terms of how many calories do you burn, one of the things that scientists have done is they've tried to quantify it. I don't know how much I love this, but it's an attempt. We can quantify energy spent during exercise. And we make these new units. It's almost like saying calories or inches or pounds are METs, metabolic equivalents. So we've created our own little scale of units for how many calories you burn. If it's a lower MET activity, it, you're not burning as many calories. So if my activity is only five METs, it's burning less calories than a 10 MET activity. And if you take that metabolic equivalent and you multiply it by the calories burned per hour, so if I know that I'm burning about 55 calories per hour, and the intensity of that activity is 3.3 METs, I could estimate how many calories I burn doing that activity. Keep in mind, this is a sedentary activity. This is your BMR. So I take my basal metabolic calories burned for a certain amount of time, multiply it by this unit of METs, some kind of metabolic equivalent for exercise. You do not have to know these. I mean, come on, it just gives us an idea, but it, it's a way of quantifying it. Obviously, a more vigorous activity, walking very, very, very briskly, is a higher MET activity than cleaning, than walking. Um, so it just gives you a quantified way. Just know the overall definition. A MET, a metabolic equivalent, is a way of quantifying how many calories we burn doing an exercise. A MET is an estimate of how many calories we burn. It's a way to measure how many calories we burn. You'll see this in some of the literature uh, with physical activity. Okay, what about, ooh, what about those little things at the gym? You know how the gym has a treadmill and it shows you how many calories you've burned? You may even have to enter your height or weight, depending on how good of a treadmill it is. Ooh, you know these, is there a picture? No. You know, sometimes the treadmill has like a little silver piece on the handle and it says, ooh, hold on to the silver piece on the handle as you exercise. Um, I mean, it's some kind of guesstimate, but it's not great. It really isn't great. Um, the technology is usually not that good. I mean, technology is changing quickly. It may get better very quickly. Um, but those sensors, you know, you touch the part on the treadmill, not great. What's better? Use an equation from a MET chart, get a whoop, go on a treadmill with the breathing apparatus. Okay, don't worry about that. Um, this tells us how many calories. These are just examples. You do not have to know them. Look at this, in the Tour de France, each day, those athletes are burning over 5,000 calories. Triathlon, like the Ironman, or half Ironman maybe, depending. Um, so you get an idea of how many calories. Um, you don't need to know these. Okay. Um, two, two, two. Okay. Um, in your critical thinking, we're going to be using an equation. So we've talked about ways that you can measure calories burned on a treadmill with a breathing apparatus on. We can estimate calories burned using a metabolic equivalent, a MET. But we can also just use a good old-fashioned equation. So in your critical thinking, I'm asking you to calculate your estimated energy expenditure. Your estimated energy expenditure is an estimate of how many calories you burn at rest. 
I'm sorry, hold on, let me say that again. This is a measurement of how many calories you burn per day. This is an estimate of how many calories you burn per day. So it's not just your basal metabolism, because look, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ask you to give a number from physical activity. It takes into account your age, an estimate of physical activity, your weight, and your height. And they are gender specific. There's one equation for males. There's one equation for female. Okay? Um, when you do this, you're going to have to do order of operations first, things in parentheses. You're going to have to convert your weight in pounds to kilos. You're going to have to convert your height in inches to meters. I give you the conversions. Your number should be, I don't know, 1,000 to 2,500, maybe 3,000, depending on your size and whatever. If you get a number that's really crazy, like 10,000, it's not the correct number. Something went wrong. Look again or ask me. Okay, last thing to wrap things up. Thanks for sticking around this long. When we talk about balancing calories, I know that each nutrient is not the same. And we talked about that. Fat, for every one gram of fat that our body burns, it gives us nine calories of energy. For every one gram of protein or carbs, it gives us four grams of energy. And there's all sorts of things that can influence how our body handles those nutrients. Time of day, age, gender, eating, eating times, eating patterns, genetics, um, individuality, everyone's a little different. For women, there are all sorts of things like hormone levels. Um, something that I'm very interested in lately is the idea that women are not just small men. Uh, if you look at a lot of scientific research, it's always been done on men. So as a matter of fact, all of these recommendations that I'm telling you from research from the last 50 years, I would say 90 plus percent of this research to get to these points was done on men. Um, so women were a little bit different. So even though we, we use these guidelines, it's so important to recognize everyone's a little bit different. Now, all that being said, I believe it is useful to start at this point. If we are looking at our um, body weight, so I'm just going to be really simplistic. My body weight. I told you I weigh about 150, maybe like 147 right now. I don't know. 150 is just a nice number, easy to work with. Um, my weight on a daily basis is mostly, again, we're oversimplifying just for understanding at the beginning, a balance of my calories in. You can't read that now, can you? <laughs> it's largely a function of my calories in through food and then my calories out what i burn through activity and that includes total metabolism total energy expenditure my basal metabolism plus exercise plus how much f calories i burned um digesting food so if i bring in 2200 calories but i need 2,600 calories. For that day, I'm at a deficit of 400 calories. Over time, if I ran at a deficit, I would lose weight. So it isn't always this easy, but I believe this to be a good starting point. Understanding a simple calorie balance at first will make it easier for us to go back later and talk about some of the specifics, right? So if I'm balanced, I'm bringing in the same number of calories that I am expending. If my food intake is greater than my calorie outtake, I might be gaining weight. If my food intake is smaller than my exercise, I might be losing weight. Um, Again, I know it's more complicated, but for a place to start, let's start here. 
We can term these in terms of positive energy balance, gain weight, negative energy balance, lose weight. Keep it simple to start. We can add in some of the other specifics later. I've given you some examples of how many calories people burn. You don't need to know them. Of course, there are some considerations. Some sports have weight-specific requirements like wrestling, even things that are um, involve how people look as part of the grading, like gymnastics or the judging. Um, and then there's individual concerns, okay? Um, if you operate at a positive or negative energy balance for too long, it could result in some bad things, which we're going to talk about later. Okay? We're going to try and achieve balance. All right. Good job, everyone. I will see you next time.